night. I feel like I'm losing control. I'm afraid I'll lose my job or even my family. Most insurance covers substance abuse. You can get back on track. Call now for hope and help with proven gentle recovery programs. I never thought that I could be somebody who didn't drink and use drugs. I have something to hold on to for strength. I'm in recovery, getting the help I need. Call 800-379-4799, 800-379-4799. Hi, I'm Joan London with A Place for Mom. Over the years, we've helped thousands of families find senior care, and today's senior living communities have never been better. With amazing amenities like movie theaters, exercise rooms and swimming pools, public cafes, bars and bistros, even pet care services. And nobody understands your options like the advisors at A Place for Mom. These are local expert advisors that will partner with you to find the perfect place and determine the right level of care, whether that's just a helping hand or full-time memory care. Best of all, it's a free service. Call today, A Place for Mom. You know your family, we know senior living. Together, we'll make the right choice. Call A Place for Mom right now to get our free ebook on financing senior care as well as a free referral for senior living communities in your area. Call 1-800-436-2907. That's 1-800-436-2907. This is Straight Talk, and I'm your host, Brandon Bryce. Are we seeing a rise in the opioid crisis? That's been true with alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and you name it. What's different here is we are now facing a very particular type of drug where it's not just an ordinary uh, potent chemical. It's a deadly chemical, and people are mixing fentanyl with opioids, and people are dying. And that's 910 AM Superstation. They'll challenge your authority. They'll try to break your will. They'll push you to the edge of your sanity. Because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory, not theirs. Defend it. Who makes the payments? Who cleans it? Who drives it? You do. That's who. And in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kids buckle up. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. This is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage. Because home is more than four walls and a roof. It's that porch swing on a summer night. It's pajamas with feet and everybody over for Sunday dinner. And that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of. This is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself so you could save on repairs. Because home is your place, your memories, your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, 
and you ain't black. It don't have nothing to do with Trump. It has to do with the fact I want something for my community. I would love to see Take you. Take a look at my record. Wait, 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 I extended wait, wait, the voting no, rights 25 you, years. I have a record that is second to none. The NAACP has endorsed me every time I've run. The war, I mean, come on. Take a look at the record. You know, I've been critical of you. Um, I, I have a few things I want to talk to you about. Today. I know you have. Yeah. You don't know me. No, I don't. That's why I want to get to know you today. I want to get to know you today. Um, I want to talk to you about mostly black stuff. I get overwhelming support from the black leadership, young and old. Every poll People, shows me. People, this is the problem with what we call politics. You heard it. Welcome to another episode of Straight Talk. I'm your host with the most. This is Brandon Bryce. I'm the People's Champion. We heard earlier in the show that Joe Biden clearly said that you ain't black. Well, guess what? We've got other people who think otherwise. Joining us, we've got Congressman Kerry Bentavolio, former Congressman. Hello, Brendan. So, Hello, I Brendan. Mean, when you, when, I mean, Congressman, you hear Joe Biden, who's president of the United States, talking about if you if you for me, you ain't, and he didn't even say you are. You ain't black. What does that mean? I'm I'm uh, I'm, good. I'm having trouble hearing you on his phone. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, we had a plug. So I mean, when you hear these things, what does that mean? For someone who, and I'll go back to the question earlier, we have Charlemagne the God talking about, uh, he was asking uh, Joe Biden, who is clearly a candidate for the president of the United States, he was asking him about, you know, what is the black agenda? And Joe Biden doesn't give an agenda. He says, if you're not, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. I mean, what does this mean, Congressman? (laughs) <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I have a little problem with uh, Biden, of course, because I'm on the other side of the aisle, and I represent the uh, Republican Party platform, which is the anti-slavery, the you know, uh, freedom uh, constitution of the United States. I have a real problem with him. He's been in Congress for, what, uh, 30 years he's been in government, more than 30 years, and what's he done? Can we actually – a point to anything worthwhile that he's done for anybody, not just blacks. You know, um, I uh, got to tell you, I I am a proud member, a former member of the 182nd Field Artillery out of the Olympia Armory in Detroit. I went to Iraq where 60 to 70 percent of my unit was black. And uh, we had some good old boys from Alabama and a few other places wanted to put up their Confederate flag in their room. <laughs> These are guys that, you know, were uh, replacements. They came in to fill the vacancies that we had. And the, my uh, fellow soldiers from the 182nd, God bless every one of them, came to me to settle this because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we're all in this together. And the thing I learned a long time ago at 18 years old in Vietnam is um, – the enemy doesn't care the color of your skin, your religion, where you're from, your political affiliations or your propensity or anything. Um, what they're concerned about is you wear a uniform that says U.S. Army. It was O.D. Green. That's the color we wear. That's the way it works. Congressman, let me ask you this. I mean, right now you're talking about, you know, this is a guy uh, who wants to be president. And you had Charlemagne the God, as we all know, he's with the Breakfast Club. Uh, the the guy clearly, every show I watch the Breakfast Club, he calls people who make idiotic comments. He calls them a donkey of the day, which is ironic that he's a Democrat. But but what's funny is <laughs> this guy this guy gave Joe Biden a pass. He gave him a pass. He didn't comment about it. Yeah. So when, so, so when yeah. you hear these type of things, I mean I mean is this? Let me ask you, Congressman, just straight up, is this an example of? double standard between Democrats and Republicans. Yes, sir. It's uh, I've said this time and again on my Facebook page. Uh, the biggest pandemic we have in this country is called hypocrisy disease. And it's, that's exactly what, what we're facing. Um, and that, 
I don't know how we combat that other than education and get to know your neighbor. You know, you don't have to look. I, you know, I ran for Congress. I got a 93% conservative Republican platform voting record, right? And you always get that one person who says, I didn't like that one vote, so I'm not supporting you. Really, what vote was it? I don't remember, but I didn't like it. I didn't like what you said. What did I say? I don't remember, but I didn't like it. You know, if we treated our spouses like that, we'd all be single. Let me ask you this, Congressman. I mean, right now, you know, the president, and I'm going to get into this a little later, the president, as we all know, um, you know, had some say and some influence in the early release of former Detroit Mayor uh, Kwame Kilpatrick. Before we get into that, I mean, when you hear the fact that this president, whether you like the guy or not, has been extremely steadfast on prison reform. I mean, he's letting us know. Joe Biden's crime bill is putting them back in. I mean, I mean, does Joe Biden owe the black community an apology for this? Yes, he does. He does. Uh, just as anybody was. They're, they're a party division. Uh, maybe the Republican Party is too at times. I, uh, me, I, I'm not. <laughs> as you well know, if you know my background, I wasn't somebody who um, followed the party line 100 percent. I was focused on representing my constituents, and I didn't color. I didn't. I didn't care what uh, what political affiliation they were. If they had an issue with VA, healthcare, uh, Social Security, whatever the federal agency they were having a problem with, they were always welcome in our office, and we won two constituent awards for doing that. So yeah, I don't. I uh, like I said. In my early ages, 18 years old, I was an infantry rifleman in Vietnam, and mm-hmm. it did not matter what your skin color was, your religion, or your political affiliation. We wore OD green. Now, in the rear areas, uh, in the base camps, or you know, out of out of the daily fray, it was a different story. But on the line, um, yeah, we're all we got to cover each other's back, and that's what we have to do. We this is America. You're an American. That's where you, you were born here. That makes you an American. And God bless America. And that's the way we should look at it. I know it sounds idealistic, um, but uh, I'm a romantic. I believe in it. <laughs> you, maybe you, 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 maybe you, you, I you, shouldn't. Oh, I don't know. I'm not there anymore. No, 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 no Congressman, you should. You know, I'll tell you, when you hear some of the early speeches of Dr. King, he talks about not judging people for the content of their color, but the, I mean, excuse me, the content of the character, excuse me, but not the content of their skin. Yeah. And so when I hear Joe Biden, who ran with the first black president, he should know better. But, but let me let me go a step further into this. So now we're talking, I mean, this brings up a much bigger issue about the African American community and the Democratic Party. Did Joe Biden just expose who the Democrats really are? Yes. Um, uh, the. The part, you know, I used to be a his, history teacher. Um, the Democratic Party is the party of slavery. They're the party of the Jim Crow laws, and we still have remnants of it today. Uh, there are bigots and hypocrites everywhere. Um, I, you know, <laughs> I wish I had a magic wand and I could wash it all away or I wish it all away or something, but. Uh, you know, we have to deal with uh, the bigots and the hypocrites and the prejudice because I've seen it. Um, I've seen black people be prejudiced. And, um, you know, it's like we, we have to be uh, they did it to us. So we'll do it to them. That kind of attitude. Uh, I don't like it no matter where it comes from. Uh, that's just me, though. I, I think I'm the minority, uh, the real minority, because, um, you know, but even even. Um, how can I say this? Um, all I can say is that um, I wasn't brought up that way. Uh, I saw it as a child, the bigotry. Uh, my uh, uncle lived in Highland Park. I don't even think the house is there today. Um, but it's um, it was he didn't move out of there until the 19, late 1960s. And um, I had my first... Um, if you will, I was from Royal Oak, and we didn't have black people out there, right? And you had to go to Detroit. And so in Highland Park, uh, I played football in the backyard with um, the neighbor kids and spent a lot of time in Highland Park. 
I loved it. You know, I didn't have any problem with it, and that's the way I was raised. Um, and when I went to Vietnam, like I said, it didn't matter. We got to we got to protect everybody's butt. So so you let there? me ask you this. Let me. Okay, I am. I am. Yeah, I can hear. You. Go ahead. Okay, great. So let me ask you this. I mean, when you hear people talk about this, I mean, what does this say to? I mean, I mean what does this mean? You know, you know, what are we saying about? Um, I mean, what are, what are we saying about just the American people? This guy wants to be president, yet he continues to talk about, you know, the issues as if, you know, black people just are supposed to vote. Uh, his Democrat, I mean, it's absurd. I want to get a couple of yeah. Three one three seven seven eight seven six hundred. This is straight talk. We're talking about Joe Biden's. Recent comments. Got a couple callers on. I want to get, uh, as always, Mr. Positive on the line. Mr. Positive, uh, what's on your mind? This is Straight Talk. Where's your calling from? Brandon and your guest, thanks for taking my call. How, just, are, you? You, How are you? you uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Good, my friend. Um, you segued right into what I wanted to say. Why does the African American community vote Democratic all the time? Is it the infrastructure? Is it the racial attitudes that were directed towards them, understanding what the gentleman and your guest said, that uh, the Democratic Party is for slavery. So why do they continuously, in large percentages, vote for um, the Democratic Party, which is a party that historically is about handouts and just giving money and like Thomas Sowell said, the advent of the downward uh, flight of the African American started with the great uh, society in the 60s where people were able to get, you know, things from the government and it didn't maybe allow them to become more independent. Am I in a right, am I going in the right way or is my total thinking totally wrong? No, no, no. You you are absolutely right. I mean, this is, and I want to go back to the congressman. Thank you for a call, uh, Mr. Positive. I want to go back you to the you. congressman because because this is absurd. The fact that he would even have the audacity to even break to even speak of something so ridiculous. And I'll, I'll tell you this. You know, he's got uh, Simone Sanders, who I believe is working on his team. I mean, doesn't this stuff get vetted by these people? <laughs> I think uh, Biden uh, he might have a mind of his own in his his um, you know in his older uh, dance stage. He might be slipping a bit, and I don't think he cares. Uh, he just thinks he deserves the seat. A lot of people believe that they deserve the seat. He's been there thirty years. It's his. It's his way or the highway. Um, luck, you know. Uh, my office staff called me one time and said that. Um, we had a bunch of protesters outside my office mm-hmm. protesting, wanting minimum wage, and uh, they wanted the DREAM Act, right? And uh, my staffer called me, and she said uh, – she was frantic. Congressman, we have a bunch of protesters outside. I said, great. Make sure they have water, coffee. Let them use the restroom. Tell them make an appointment and mm-hmm. thank them for exercising the First Amendment rights. And um, I said that at a debate against my Democrat opponent and the uh, some lady in the audience says, oh, but you called the police on us. No, we didn't. If a staffer would have called the police, they probably would have been fired. Uh, it was the uh, business next door to ours because the protesters were blocking a parking space. You know, And I, I understand. They were probably nervous. Uh, when you bust a bunch of people in from Detroit, Democrats, I have no idea, sir, why uh, people of Detroit continue or – any black community continues to vote for the very people that are oppressing them. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are mm-hmm. Republicans out there that are just as bigoted and biased. I like to call them Bloomberg Republicans or um, rhinos. That's the term for them. Dr. King said it best, and I used to teach him at, in American literature because he's a great writer, and uh, I tried to push it. It's the character of the person. You know, that's the way it is. Um, that's the way I look at it. I'm, and some people say I'm far too trusting, and they're probably right sometimes. But um, I, I have a real problem with Biden. He doesn't represent the party or the belief system that I have. Uh, I'm a Blinken guy. 
um, let me ask you this. Would it be wrong to say to the um, uh, black community continues to vote uh, Democrat that if Jesus freed your soul and Lincoln freed your body, can the Republicans free your mind? Uh, well, you know, you, you know, here's here's the deal. Here's the deal, Congressman. You know, I am in. A, I thought we lived in an America where people had the opportunity to choose which party they wanted to represent. It's not you and my job to tell them who to vote for or how to vote. But apparently, Joe Biden believes that it's actually his job to tell people how to think and how to vote. And I'm going to tell you something, Congressman, and anybody out there, three one three seven seven eight seven six hundred. Uh, call in the straight talk. I want to get your thoughts on this because we're talking about a man running for president telling people that they, if they don't vote Democrat, they ain't black. Folks, you can't make this type of stuff up. No, you, you can't. can't make this up. <laughs> it's craziness. It really is. It's like uh, you know, uh, we we need to have uh, people need to have a mind of their own, do their homework, and research the person who's running for office. I know um, uh, in the I think it's the 13th district encompasses Detroit, where Tlaib is. Uh, you have two uh, Republican candidates, uh, Limo that I know of, and um, uh, the dude, Dudenhofer. And I know Dudenhofer really well. Uh, he's an honest person, and he he's um, He's uh, he's strictly constitution, and he's probably doesn't have a bigot, bigoted bone in his body, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think Al Limo's the same way. Uh, he's pro-life. Uh, both of them are pro-life. And uh, I'd suggest that people give him a chance. I mean, come on. If, if, look what happened to Detroit under Democratic leadership. Look what happened to Chicago, Democratic leadership. Look what happened to Philadelphia, Democratic leadership, Washington, D.C., you know, take a look at the truth, observation, see it for yourself. And if you continue to do what you always did, you're always going to get what you always got. And if you want something different, do something different. And that's basically you know, you the know, definition of what? Know, Foolishness. You know, you know, Congressman, let me tell you this, and I'm going to end on this note. Before we can, we got our next guest coming on. Before we take a quick break, the reality is Einstein – Literally, one said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the reality is, if African Americans, after this comment, vote for this guy, they deserve what they get. Congressman, glad to have you back on. We'll have you back on soon, and always appreciate your your, your thoughts. You're a great American. Thank you. God bless you, Brandon. I appreciate your the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I enjoy right. your conversations. Thank you. Uh, all right, all right. Before we come back, don't touch that dial. We've got C.J. Jordan coming on all the way from D.C. We're going to take a quick break and come back. When we come back, we're going to continue to stay on this issue about Biden tells you that if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Got C.J. Jordan coming on. When we come back on Straight Talk. Brought to you by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Stay home and stay safe. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. 40 million. That's the number of free phones still available and the number of how many Americans can still get prescriptions free. Free could be wonderful. That's why I'm still working at 77 years old to pay off my prescriptions. I needed to have a... A prescription failed and I had to leave because I couldn't afford it. Call now and see what's available for you. Free prescriptions. Over 10 million people get prescriptions free. And the program has expanded so another 40 million can. Free dental. Over 15,000 dentists have provided over $330 million in free dental work. Free cell phones. 40 million free cell phones are still available with free minutes and more. Free cell phone would change my life right now because it is something I cannot afford to get. Medical supplies like back braces, knee braces, and diabetic supplies may be covered too. The free RX Plus hotline has saved callers over $12 million on their prescription costs. These free programs are now available to 40 million more people. Call now. Attention. In July 2018, Bayer announced that it will be halting its sales of Assure. The Assure birth control may break or migrate after insertion, puncturing the fallopian tube, resulting in corrective surgery to remove the device 
thousands of women have reported debilitating health problems to the FDA. In April 2018, the FDA restricted sales of Assure to protect women and require that patients receive risk information. Please call 800-425-9539. We're the hottest station in town. Whatever you need, it's right here on 910 AM Superstation. The most powerful voices in the urban community. I heard on the news about that five-year-old who found his uncle's gun. The kid didn't know it was loaded. I heard on the news about that 14-year-old girl who was bullied online for like a year. She couldn't take it anymore, so she got her dad's gun from his nightstand. I heard on the news about that guy who broke into someone's house, stole a gun from the hall closet. He accidentally shot his cousin in the head. She killed herself. And later, killed the owner of the store he was trying to rob. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Stay up to date with current events and breaking news on our Facebook page. Search and like 910 AM Superstation on Facebook, and you'll see everything new, everything exciting, and all things Detroit. 910 AM Superstation News on Facebook Live right now. And we are back. We were earlier. We were talking about uh, the fact that Joe Biden believes that if you aren't Democrat, then you ain't black. Folks, I didn't say it. Joe Biden said it. Joining us all the way from our nation's capital, Washington D.C., we've got C.J. Jordan on the line. C.J., welcome to welcome to Straight Talk. Your first time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be with you. Thank you. Finally, I'm glad we got you on. So, C.J., earlier we were talking to Congressman. Kerry Bentivoglio, and we were talking about the fact that Joe Biden believes that if you are not a Democrat or if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Uh, what does this mean to you, CJ, as, a, as an African American well, woman? I think it's very condescending. And for me, ever since I took my first breath out of my mother's womb, I have been black. So to insult the African American and black community voters out there and assume that we're going to vote for him, um, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, so, I, so, I CJ, I, so, so, CJ, let me ask you this. I mean, this is a man who wants to be uh, president of the United States. This is also a man who many have said uh, possibly there could be some health issues. I mean, I mean, we're not blaming it on the alcohol, but could we blame it on, you know, some health issues that maybe Joe didn't know what he was saying? Well, I mean, look, the gentleman has some – some mental difficulties, um, probably the onset of dementia. Um, we won't never know because he won't release his health records at the, you know, at the moment. And there's been no independent, you know, neurologist to verify the um, fact that we know um, he's had multiple, you know, aneurysms and catheterizations um, mm -hmm. over over the years in. You know, when you have strokes and aneurysms, it does do affect your mental capacity over time. And, I mean, he's approaching 80 years of age. So, um, I mean, he continues to make gas every year, every day. So, here we are. So, let me Thank ask you, you this, CJ. Go ahead. So, see, that, I mean, we'll, we'll there are a couple couple quick callers. We've got a couple callers coming in. But before we do, I want to ask you this. I mean, did Joe Biden, and I asked the congressman this, so I'll be fair to you, did Joe Biden expose who the Democratic Party really is and who they think they are when it comes to minority voters, specifically black voters? Well, here's the thing. I mean, African-American voters, we are sophisticated voters, but again, here's a man who assumes that in you know 2020 that the black community is not going to look at his his record, the things that he's done. Um, he's created the biggest generational of young kids who were fatherless. You know, you 
He did the 94 crime bill. He shepherded. He wrote it. He made sure it got passed for Clinton. He has ownership of that. He was the lead co-sponsor of the bill, the lead sponsor in the United States Senate. Um, here's a person, irrespective of what you thought of Clarence Thomas, he was a person who treated a black woman, Anita Hill, like crap. So all of these things begin to add up. Telling a lie that he he marched with your fraternity brother, the late, you know, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and he didn't and told that tale for 30 years, and no one had corrected him until just recently, and his staff didn't correct him until recently. So these are things that I think um, younger voters are going to look at, and I think this is going to be the first time that I call the hip-hop generation voter is not going to be in lockstep with the older voter who is 65 and want to be uh, familiar with him based on how long he's been in Congress. All right, 313-778-7600. This is Straight Talk. We're talking to C.J. Jordan uh, of the Jordan Manager Group. We're talking about Joe Biden's recent comments. We've got a couple callers, C.J. Uh, let's start with Ron. What's on your mind? This is Straight Talk. Where are you calling from? Detroit, man, the one, the only, me, Rod. <laughs> God's okay. Rod. Rod, it, that's in the Bible, the Rod of God. Uh, God, Rod, Rod, Rod of God. Or, what, what's your question, Rod? It's in the Bible, though. I want people to look it up. But anyway, here we go. This is what I'm going to say. Now, first of all, I want to talk about Joe Biden, but first let me talk about how black people are acting right now on this holiday and how they've been acting. They are like it's like Bobby Door and going in and out, gas stations, liquor stores, no face masks on. Something's got to give. Somebody's got to regulate this stuff, man, because you got people just acting very irresponsibly, like you know nothing is out here. So you're going to have to reach out to the mayor, city council. They're going to have to start talking to the FM stations, all of these hip hop stations. They have to put out the uh, message on a daily basis to say, listen, you got to cover up your face. You've got a six-feet distance. you got to put on a face shield if necessary. Rod, the guy, we're talking about Joe Biden's comments, not not, not oh. uh, coronavirus. No, I got you on that. I'm about to do that right now, but I, tell you, I just had to put that out there first because that, that's serious. So let me say okay. this about Joe Biden. I mean, are you serious? We know what he really meant. <laughs> But here's the thing. He needs Hillary Clinton. He needs Hillary Clinton to be his vice president nominee. He needs somebody to help him out because he does have problems with saying stuff that's kind of unorthodox. So he needs somebody like Hillary Clinton to be the greatest vice president nominee ever. If she has, if, if he gets Hillary Clinton to help him out, the Republicans will be so scared. They don't want to see Hillary Clinton be his vice president nominee. Now, what he okay, said was this. Rod, 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 this is what he was got saying. Off the got off the call, buddy. So this, this is, is what he was Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, Ken, what's on your mind? This is Straight Talk. Hey, I just want to want, want just, 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 just chime in. Yeah. So, so uh, Mr. Mr. Biden uh, may have, not, not may have, but he did make a comment. But I just, uh, just, just curious why. You aren't uh, balancing your conversation to include his follow-up to what he previously stated, because he he did attempt to clean it up, and 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 to clarify that. So I'm just I, I'm just putting it out there that okay, hey, not just not just solely not just solely focusing on 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 what he previously said, but what about his follow-up? Mm-hmm. To where where he clarified what he what 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 he, what he said. Well, well, well hold, hold on, hold, hold on, Ken. Ken, you know, let's station manager, let's roll the comments made by Joe Biden, so we're clear on what was said. And CJ, you as well, roll it. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, and you ain't black. It don't have nothing to do uh, with wait, Trump. Wait, wait, it has to do with the stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, uh, folks. I think and, and th- thank you, Ken, for your call. I, I, I brought some other callers. Uh, I mean, CJ, it's pretty clear what he's saying. I mean, I mean, when you hear this, you're thinking, where is Simone Sanders, who's supposed to be 
his black outreach person who's supposed to be reading over the doctors that go out, who's supposed to be dealing with the press. Where is she? What happened? Well, Simone came out and did clean up in aisle five. But here's the thing. If it was not, if he was really sincere about trying to apologize, why did it take him to 2 p.m. on a call with Ron Bugsby and the U.S. Black Chamber of Commerce with black business owners? He said that at 10 o'clock that morning, he took five hours to apologize. So here again, the author of the 1994 crime bill. But I remember that following year in 1995 when black men from across America on buses, trains, planes, and automobiles came to the Million Man March because of the 1994 crime bill and in mass incarceration. Black men wanted to feel whole. And how is this person going to sit out there and tell black men and black women that, hey, if you don't vote for me or if you're thinking about not voting for Trump or if you're questioning my motives, you're not black. I, I, I mean, I it's am. totally, it's, it, you know, CJ, it's totally absurd. I want to get a couple callers, one more, a couple last minute callers in. Uh, Jacob, what's on your mind? This is Straight Talk. Where are you calling from? Hey, Brandon, how are you? Uh, hey, how are you? Hey, good. Just a couple comments. First of all, what Joe Biden said, whether he was making a joke, whether he was serious, it was dumb, it was stupid, it's unacceptable. We just need to start there. I'm not going to get any Democratic Party conspiracies or whatnot. It was just dumb and stupid. Now, mm-hmm. he wouldn't do that in the other community. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't go to a group of Jews and make a comment like that. I think what you'll no, see, he and I'm glad to no, see he it, wouldn't. Is, is the African-American community finally stepping up and saying, we're not taking this anymore. Take us seriously. You don't get to come on our show, say what up, do the wobble, and play these games. We want to hear policy. We want to hear agenda. Second thing I have to say is, one, he's still – I'm going to think politically here. He has time to clean this up, and what he needs to do is come back and say, hey, here's what I'm going to do for you, and be specific. You lift every voice and sing policy. That, that load of crap ain't going to cut it. It's rehashed. Oh, 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 hold, on, hold, 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 hold on, Jacob. Hold on, hold on, Jacob. Hold on, Jacob. Hold on, Jacob. I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back a little bit because what he should have done with Charlemagne the God, Charlemagne the God asked him for a black agenda. And guess what? Joe Biden didn't give it. Instead, he didn't have he one. Said, that's what he said. He didn't have one. So here's the issue, Jacob. And thank you, Jacob, for calling. I got to get over to my other caller. Uh, but, but, but that's the issue, folks, is that we've got a guy who doesn't have a plan. Joe doesn't have a plan. That's the reality of what we're dealing with, folks. I got one more call on here. Uh, Aaron, tell them what's on your mind. This is Straight Talk. Where are you calling from? Hi there. Once again, a fantastic show. Uh, you Thank really you. cover Thank both sides of the issue beautifully. Very intelligent. Your uh, guest is very intelligent and insightful. And your your previous caller here down the block, I happen to be Jewish. And can you imagine him calling into a Jewish talk show and saying, Oy vey, if you don't vote for me, you ain't Jewish. Or <laughs> you're not Jewish. Can you imagine him? When does he say you ain't? Anywhere. He was doing it to play to the black community. Can you imagine him calling in an Islamic show and saying, Allahu Akbar, you ain't Muslim, or you're not? <laughs> it's insulting. And I am so happy to hear callers calling him out on this. You have a, a, an intelligence show, and tonight the callers are showing their intelligence. They're not falling for Joe's crap. He's been a racist for 40 years. Go back to when he was calling uh, President Obama a clean cut intelligent speaking black man i mean he's just insulting he's been in he's been there 40 years he's got nothing new to offer the black community the jewish community or america and thank you once again for your show i'm going to listen it's fantastic tonight no thank you thank you cj i want to roll back to you i mean so right now cj and i want to segue on to a different topic which is relevant you talked about the 94 crime bill you talked about blacks incarcerated you talked about Black men not being at home with their families. I want to get into Kwame Kilpatrick. Yes, we're talking about sexual, sexual. Kwame Kilpatrick, the former mayor of Detroit, is now coming home, folks. What is this? And, and, and here's the catch, CJ. Some critics have said he's coming home not because of COVID. He's coming home because of Trump. 
What's your thoughts on this, uh, CJ? Well, for a person, you know, co-founder of the Committee of 40, um, we signed on and wrote a letter early on to the president, to Jared and Jerron Smith, um, asking for, you know, early release. And he deserves to come home. Um, he's done his time. Come home. Be uh, Continue to be a leader in the community. Talk and mentor to young men on what the mistakes that he made in his past. And the Bible tells you everybody believes and deserves a second chance. And this is the president giving him that opportunity to come home, get back with his brotherhood and Alpha Phi Alpha, get back with 100 black men, and re-energize the community and mentor some young men and talk about the path going forward and how he can make a difference in his community. And I appreciate the president going against the U.S. attorney in Michigan and saying, let him come home on a compassionate release. So let me ask you this, CJ. I mean, you know, while, while you're on, I mean, what does this mean for Michigan? I mean, we know that in 2016, uh, the president won Wayne County. For those out there in La La Land who don't know, Wayne County is the largest county in the state of Michigan. It's also the county that the city of Detroit sits in. Uh, he did not win the city of Detroit, but he did win Wayne County. So, I mean, what is, I mean, is this a, could this be a repeat for 2020? Could Trump? soon win Michigan again in November. I think the president is going to be in every state, not just in Michigan, but in every state. And I think the people that he will continue to reach out to, to put on the ground and his game team and farm team will, you know, go door to door, street by street, block by block. And we're going to compete, you know, for the African American vote. And if, the Democrats, which they always do, they go to the local NAACP, drop a whole bunch of money, and I love Reverend Wendell Anthony, and they're going to go out there and say, hey, we've done our part because we got a table and we've dumped all of this money into the Freedom Fund Bank. That ain't going to work this year. That dog don't hunt. We're going to compete for the black vote in Michigan, in Wayne County, and we're going to show that, guess what, Republicans, we're going to show up, we're going to show out, and we're going to ask for that vote this year. All right, that's C.J. Jordan calling all the way from our nation's capital. First time on the show. She did great. C.J., you're a proud American. We've got to have you back on soon. Thank you so much. All right, all right. C.J., help C.J. Jordan. Folks, right now we're talking about the fact that now Kwame Kilpatrick, the infamous mayor of Detroit, some say he should have went away. He got 28 years, but guess what, folks? He's coming home. I want to bring a guy all the way from uh, the – our nation's capital, again, we got a lot of D.C. folks calling in tonight. Uh, Deontay Jackson, he is the one of the founders of Black Voices for Trump uh, and is a leading advocate in conservative politics in America. Deontay, welcome to the show. Welcome to Straight Talk. Brandon, how are you? How are you? Always good to see you, my friend. So, Deontay, we were just talking about Trump, come, uh, uh, Trump coming home. No, uh, Kwame Kilpatrick coming home. I mean, what does this mean for Black voters in Michigan. I mean, is this going to move the edge? I mean, I mean, how much of this was uh, the president versus how much was this was the coronavirus? Well, you know, I, it's been it's been a talk for quite some time, um, and I think the coronavirus put a push on it. Um, I was talking to Angela Stanton Foon, who was someone um, earlier today, who was someone who advocated this with the American King Foundation. Her, Alveda King, worked with Jared. Kushner worked with Jerron Smith and worked with Nicole Frazier from the White House, and they advocated and pushed for this um, together to make sure that that release um, was done. I know that he had some problems with asthma, um, um, it would have put him at risk, high risk with the coronavirus, and then he can be reunited with his family. So, I mean, I mean, right now, you know, I mean, where do we go from here? I mean, you've got Kwame Kilpatrick. Uh, who did a lot of good things, but some people said that serial killers don't even get 28 years, yet the mayor of Detroit uh, got 28 years, got a 28-year sentence. Uh, many on the right and the left thought that it was an unfair, unjust sentence. Uh, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, I mean, you know, is this justice being served, or is this politics? Um, I think it's just, I mean, it's not, I don't think, I know it's justice being served. One of the things that we have seen through this administration time and time again is the president's loyalty to criminal justice reform. 
And so we understood that in, 20, in 2016, one of the biggest problems that people had is with our criminal justice system. Not just people, one of the biggest problems that African Americans had was with our criminal justice system. And so we understand that, and we know that through that, uh, it has benefited so many people who are wrongfully um, sentenced or got a, to, to have a sentence such as um, where I'm from, Illinois, the former governor, uh, Robert Burnage. So we got, we got a couple of callers. The phone lines are blowing up, folks. We want to hear your thoughts. 313-778-7600. This is Straight Talk. We're talking about textual sexual mayor Kwame Kilpatrick is coming home, folks. He's coming home. We got a caller. We got Dre on the line. What's your uh, What's your question? This is Straight Talk. Where are you calling from? Comment. This is going to work out good for the neighborhood. She's going to be able to help the neighborhoods out a lot better than um, Michael Duggan. He's going to be able to help clean up the neighborhoods. He's going to be able to help to get the facial recognition to help out individuals clean up the neighborhoods as far as crime and trash. Now, let me talk about Joe Biden. He meant, we know what he meant. He was the vice president to a black man. So that means that he may have said it a harsh type of way, but what he meant was by him being a black uh, the vice president to a black man, he's he's saying that look, if if I am a vice president to a black man, that means that if you, you don't vote for me, you're not black because he was supported by who? A black man. So he may have said he may have said it on the context. But all right, all right, all right. Uh, we have another caller in. Thank you, thank you, Dre, for calling in. We've got uh, Esprit. What's on your mind? This is Straight Talk. Yes. Well, thank you for uh, letting me come on a straight talk. And uh, <clears throat> my comments are kind of light or sarcastic, but uh, they have a, a tinge of uh, a seriousness uh, a tied to them. First of all, Kwame Kilpatrick is a political criminal. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's already been uh, established. Okay. So – whether you say he got too much time or uh, not enough time, he has been labeled a political criminal. He has been caught in the act, and he even admits that some of the things in which he's done uh, were totally unlawful. Correct? I agree. I agree. I'm just... But, 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 but here, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Here's the catch. The question I want to ask you, and any of you folks out there listening on your radios, on your TVs, I mean, right now, let me ask you this. Was this political or was this about coronavirus? I mean, do you think this is going to impact uh, Trump's election for the state of Michigan in 2020? Okay. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, the motivation for his release. You know, all of it was political. He's been trying to get released for a long time, and uh, – and uh, and he was using any and every opportunity uh, to do so. So here's an opportunity for, uh, or as they say, a, a loophole, uh, the coronavirus. And so as a result of that, he used it and was successful. You know, uh, so so that's that. Uh, so can you say was that political? Yes. Was that about the coronavirus? Yes, he used that as a basis for a, uh, you know, uh, the. Uh, All right, Esper, I've got to move on. I've got to move on. But thank you for calling okay, in. The whole so, thank you for calling in. So, I mean, right now, Deontay, I mean, what is this? I mean, where do we go from here? I mean, we've got the vice president uh, basically saying that if you don't vote Democrat or vote for him, you ain't black. Uh, and then we've got. Uh, a mayor of Detroit who, you know, when Biden and Obama could have released him uh, or could have pushed to release him, they chose not to. I mean, what does this mean for Michigan? I mean, is Michigan at play? Is Michigan going to be the decision maker to decide if Trump returns back to uh, 1600 Pennsylvania? Well, I mean, what, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, Michigan is going to be at play. Michigan is going to be a decision maker. It may not be the tail law. But Michigan is a very important state. President Trump won Michigan in 2016 and then the text to win it again in 2020. 
And, you know, this is something that, like I said before, the president has been fighting for criminal justice reform for quite some time, his entire administration. And so, you know, some people are going to say, oh, this is political. He's just trying to get reelected. And some people who looked at the facts and looked at the facts and said, well, they've been fighting for criminal justice reform. He's been releasing people all over the country. It's just about right that he did the same here in Detroit. Deandre, let me ask you this. What does it mean to black voters when you literally – I mean, I could, we could say this. You've got one presidential candidate who has a history of locking black folks up, and then you've got another presidential candidate who, whether you like the guy or not, he's actually releasing more African Americans than probably any administration uh, in, in previous years. I mean, does that resonate – the issue of uh, – I mean, I mean, does that resonate with black voters? Well, it should. You know, like I said, in 2016, I remember being on the campaign trail, and I remember hearing what the means were, and I remember hearing what people said was important to them. And criminal justice reform hit, was at the top of the list. Criminal justice reform was important to the black community. This president has delivered on that. He has delivered on criminal justice reform. He has pardoned people all over this country, and we talk about people such as Alec Murray Johnson, who – uh, Rob Blorovich, you know, and the list goes on and on. Angela Stanton King, who was very instrumental in making and in communicating with Jerron um, Smith and Jared Kushner and making sure that Kim uh, Patrick was released. Let me ask you this. I, I want to segue to a different topic. We talk about uh, the black church, and we talk about how important uh, the black church is. I mean, right now, when you hear that the president uh, is literally, uh, you know, pushing to make church an essential service, uh, is this something that resonates also with black voters in addition to prison reform? Well, you know, it should. Um, I think right now there are – you can tell which church um, – and I hate to say that, but you can tell which churches are political and you can tell which churches aren't. Um, we've always – I always growing up, I've always heard – um, pastors talk about the importance and how essential it is every Sunday, how essential it is to be in the house of the Lord. That only happens when it goes into their favor. So they've always talked about how essential it is, but now that the president endorses that it's essential and that everyone should be able to be able to worship on Sunday morning, now there are some individual pastors, and I'm not going to name the name because I know Detroit is the gospel capital, so I don't want to get in trouble, but there are some pastors that feel otherwise. So, I mean, I mean, right now, we, so, so let me ask you this. I mean, right now, we've got churches, and, and I've been very critical on this because it appears in the wake of COVID that churches are under attack. I mean, anytime you can go, and I've said this before, anybody who listens to the show, anytime you can go to the liquor store, but you can't worship, uh, there's something wrong with that. That's very un American. There's a, there's a major problem with that, um, Brandon, and and not even just the liquor stores. We talk about the grocery stores. We talk about people are able to pretty much, you know, besides have large, large groups, um, large groups, people are able to do a lot. I've seen in the Midwest, especially in Illinois, the factories have started to open up. So people can now go to work, work in factories where there's multiple people and um, people are sometimes close together but they can't go and worship. You know, pastors and churches are prepared. Um, I've talked to a lot of pastors this weekend. They said, well, we're prepared to open back up. We're going to do the social distancing. We're going to do um, temperature checks as people are coming in the room and then into the church. We're going to make sure that people are wearing masks and that they're not hugging and doing all of that. Why can't they come into the church and hear the word, hear the word of the Lord, and why can't they worship? I, I agree with you. Uh, I, we had a couple call, more calls calling. Uh, Arthur, Mac, what's on your mind? This is Straight Talk. Where are you calling from? Yes, I'm calling from Orlando, Florida. My name is Arthur Mac. I would like to know, uh, Patrick is getting out of jail. Are these charges going to be expunged that, that he was charged with before he get out? Arthur, we lost you. Yes, uh, I wanted to know if the charges that he had when he first got sentenced for the 28 years, are these mm-hmm. charges going to be expunged before he gets out of jail? 
I still can't hear you, Arthur. Yes, I think I'm he's saying. asking are the charges going to be expunged or commuted. And I believe this oh. I believe it's the commuted sentence. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. And, and let yeah, me let, for our, for, wait, hold on, Arthur. For our listeners, Deontay, can you explain what that is? What that means? So um, the expungement pretty much wipes the record clean. Um, the commuted sentence uh, takes that and just gives them pretty much with releasing someone on good, with good, good, um, good time and call it a compassionate release is what they're calling it. All right, all right. So did, did that answer your question, Arthur? Yes, it would. But what I'm saying, if the charges are not expunged, uh, everybody is saying that he's going to do so much for Detroit, he's not going to be able to do anything if these charges are not expunged from his record. All right, all right. Thank you, Arthur. Will, Arthur, I've got other guests calling on. So, 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 I want to get back to you really quick, Deontay, before you go. I mean, right now we, we talk about Michigan vet play. Uh, we've got a vice president that is literally making mistakes daily. Uh, we've got a VP. Excuse me. We've got a president who's got a challenge with the African American community and specifically women voters. I mean, you know, if you had to piggyback. Uh, what would you say Trump needed to do to win the election? And then also, what advice would you give Joe Biden at this point, uh, just kind of following what's going on in the narrative right now? So what is the losers? Who would you say? So uh, the, thing, the first thing to the president is I want the president to continue to do what he's doing. This president has made it his mission to continue to work for Americans. And so, so many people are going to say, He's just he's trying to get reelected, but you can't say that with Donald J. Trump. You can say with any other president, but not Donald J. Trump, because since 2017, he has been working for the black community. He has put the black agenda at the top of his list. And so I tell the president, continue what you're doing, continue to go over the things that we have done through this administration, and and let's and let's highlight those things. As for Joe Biden, Joe Biden, stop listening to Simone D. Sanders because Simone D. Sanders does not speak for the black community, and you can't say what she said because I believe that, mm-hmm. oh, you ain't black thing, that ain't nobody but Simone. Let me let, let me ask you this before you go. Uh, you know, right now, you know, I, I'm starting to see a lot of 2016 uh, happening all over again. We remember Hillary's conversation, which was ironic. It was with the Breakfast Club where she pulled out – some hot sauce. She didn't even have the right hot sauce. She put out some hot sauce and said, well, I've got my hot sauce and I'm always ready. I mean, these are what I, this is what these people think black people are. They, this is what they and think she they went are. Into the black church. And she went into the black church and she said, I don't feel no ways tired. Um, and she, so she, it's, it's, to me, it's like a, it's like a, them making a mockery out of the black community and the black race. It's that this is what they think we are. This is what they think is important to us. That Hillary Clinton thinks that hot sauce is important to us. That Joe Biden thinks that Ebonics like ink is something that we just like to use in a professional environment. Yeah, this is the problem with the Democrat Party, and this is why they constantly lose, and this is why they constantly they try to relate to the black community, but they're not really related to the black community because the black community to them is only a vote. All right, all right, uh, Deontay, you are, first of all, you're a proud American. Keep up the good work. Uh, the president, I think, is going to literally win this election with ease. I mean, people think that he's going to get blown away. I don't think so. I mean, we're talking about facts, not fiction. Keep doing what you're doing. We'll have you back on soon. Thank you. Enjoy. All right, all right. When we come back, I was, don't touch that dial. We're going to talk about and getting to the issue of what we call a 5G technology. But also, we're going to talk about the fact that the federal government now wants to grow. But here's the problem. They want to grow with your money. When we come back. On Straight Talk. Brought to you by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Do your part to slow the spread of COVID-19 by staying home and staying safe. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. The day you lose your strength is the day you lose your independence. Muscle is lost with age, affecting your energy, balance, and mobility. Before you know it, you're depending on others just to get through the day. But you can reverse and prevent muscle loss. 
Introducing MyoHealth, a revolutionary proven approach to increased muscle strength and function in as little as 30 days. Live life on your terms with more energy and confidence. After a serious health issue put me down, MyoHealth's getting me back up again. I'm doing activities that I haven't done for a long time. It really works. MyoHealth is a safe, natural dietary supplement. The result of decades of research and 24 human clinical studies. You can live stronger at any age with greater strength, mobility, balance, and energy. Call or go online now and take the MyoHealth 30-Day Strength Challenge. So you've decided to go to college. That's cool. So pop quiz, which is a better way to earn your degree? Commute to college and fill your gas tank, get stuck in traffic, drive in bad weather, try to find a parking space, walk a half mile to class, or learn online at Independence University. In the park on a bench, on the beach on a towel, or on your couch with your kid, your campus is wherever you want it to be. You don't go to college. College goes to you. That's Independence. That's Independence University. You schedule classes around your schedule, and all your supplies, including a brand new laptop and tablet, are included with tuition. At Independence U, you'll learn from professional instructors with real work experience. You'll get personal support in school and employment assistance when you graduate. Get your degree, but keep your life. That's Independence. That's Independence University. So if you're really smart, you call now. Call 1-800-556-7791. Independence U for an independent U. Call 1-800-556-7791. Have you been denied credit or hit with high interest rates? A low credit score happens to many of us, and millions of people are victims of incorrect items on their credit reports and don't even know it. That's why you need credit repair now. Our proven process has resulted in past clients seeing on average 11 negative items removed from their credit report and a 40-point increase after the first four months in our program. Call now and request your credit report and credit score for free in minutes. Call 1-800-783-9197. Pull out your smartphones and tablets right now and follow the hottest station in town. That's right, 910 AM Superstation is bringing the conversation to social media. Search us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Periscope. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. This is Straight Talk, and I'm your host, Brandon Bryce. Are we seeing a rise in the opioid crisis? That's been true with alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and you name it. What's different here is we are now facing a very particular type of drug where it's not just an ordinary a potent chemical it's a deadly chemical and people are mixing fentanyl with opioids and people are dying and that's 910 a.m superstation this is why you work so hard to pay the mortgage because home is more than four walls and a roof it's that port swing on a summer night it's pajamas with feet and everybody over for sunday dinner and that old stuffed chair in the living room you just can't get rid of this is why you work a second job. This is why you learn to fix things yourself, so you could save on repairs. Because home is your place, your memories, your family sleeping in their own beds at night. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. And now even more options are available. Call 888-995-HOPE today. That's 888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Good night, Mama. This is why. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. WFDF Farmington Hills, Detroit. 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Dance as we dip in the melodic sea. With all right, all right, all right. All right. We are back. You know, I want to just for those folks who missed our first half of the show we had an amazing uh, panel and we got an amazing panel coming on now we got scotty bowman he is a uh, state one of the state directors for the libertarian party movement here in detroit and he's a rising star in libertarian politics in america uh, all, all over the country but he's based here in michigan but i want to play something for you scotty before we start uh let's station manager let's roll the clip from earlier from joe biden on what he said 
Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. It don't have nothing okay, to do with let's Trump. Stop let's, stop, let's stop it right there. Scotty, I mean, right now, I, <laughs> the fact is, he said if you ain't Democrat and you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Uh, what does that mean to you? I mean, you you represent a, a establishment that's growing in America, and you represent an establishment that's saying, you know, the Democratic Party isn't working for Republicans or Democrats. Choose Libertarian. I mean, what's your thoughts on this, Scotty? Okay, first, I just need to clarify my title. I'm not state director of the Libertarian Party. I'm state director of Our American Initiative, which is a nonpartisan libertarian think tank. I am involved right. in the Libertarian Party as a newsletter editor. Um, right. <laughs> and I have directed presidential campaigns, so I, I, I've done a lot, so I know it's confusing. Um, yeah, now, to answer your question, I, my first thought was try – Try running that by people during the Reconstruction era. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, Scott, yeah. I, I mean, Scotty, the fact you, you said you have worked on presidential campaigns, clearly this mm -hmm. stuff gets vetted. Your stuff gets vetted by people. How did folks let that go? I mean, how did his African American point person allow that to even make it to, to the show? I, I've done shows on Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, ironically, calls folks who do say stupid things, he calls them a donkey of the day. But personally, Joe Biden didn't get the donkey of the day. Why do you think that was? I, I really don't know what's going on there. And, I mean, as far as I, there seems to be a lack of clear thought or filter um, that we have with our current president, I think maybe Joe Biden's trying to emulate that, that somehow he thinks that maybe he could be more like Trump by making more gaffes, but I don't think it's really going to work for him, especially one that offends a member, you know, a group that wants to be his base, effectively. Um, and I guess now he's saying, well, either you're my base or you're not black, I mean, which is ridiculous, um, that any anyone would assume to tell another human being what defines them ethnically, and that they somehow are the gatekeeper, that, that Joe Biden would think that somehow he's a gatekeeper to deciding who is or is not black, which is just absolutely ridiculous. And I, I just have no understanding of why anyone would say something like that other than the man's losing his mind. Let me ask you this, and, and let, let's get to that, because folks have said, I mean, I mean you got two white Males, both in over 60, both fairly wealthy. Uh, you represent an establishment that says we need to try something new. Is it time for a third party candidate? Well, and we are trying new things. We've got a few things new. I, I um, actually was a delegate to the National Convention of the Libertarian Party, and we had our first online convention, on, I mean, of any political party I know of in the United States. I mean, a full online convention um, with um, for the election of president. And we um, nominated a woman. Uh, our vice presidential candidate was almost um, John Mann, so I guess would, um, would, be, would have been fun to see him taking exception with Joe Biden since he's an African-American man. But he, he lost by a couple points to um, – Spike Cohen, who's our VP candidate. So we've been doing things different. For the first time, our party's finally running a woman for president. I guess we fell behind the Democrats on that. Um, but, um, you know, we're not really about identity politics. But just at some point, it's a bad look if every candidate you have always looks the same. And so I think it's good that, that this is different. Um, and, we, and she's a great spokesperson for the cause. So it, it, we're about individualism. And if somebody... And, and the fact that people want to claim that somehow they own a demographic, they own a group of people, and that these people belong to them. These are their voters. That, you know, as if it's, that's backwards. No. The voters choose the candidates. The candidates should not be choosing the voters. Okay, the voters need to pick who they want to be president, what philosophy they believe in. It's totally bass backwards for the politicians to telling the people, hey, if you're in this group, then you got to back me. 
I mean, I, you know, Scotty, I think it's absurd that, you know, it reminds me, and I, I said this to one of my earlier guests, it reminds me in 2016 when Hillary Clinton uh, literally pulled out hot sauce, ironically, at, at, at uh, uh, the Breakfast Club uh, and said that, you know, she was ready. She always keeps her hot sauce with her. I mean, to me, that's offensive. I mean, what if this was – I mean, Joe Biden, ironically, would not have said this to the LGBT community. He would not have said this to the Jewish community. And so I find it appalling that Joe Biden, who ran with the first African-American candidate for president and won, would say something as stupid as that. No, I'm not so sure he wouldn't have said it to any, other, any members of any of the other communities because, I mean, it's – if he doesn't have enough sense to not say that about black people, then I can't necessarily assume he has enough sense to not say that about anybody. Um, now, the hot sauce comment kind of gets me by surprise here because I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand the context. Where, did she bring hot sauce to just a speaking interview with, that where food was not being served to make some kind of point? I, I mean, the point, the point is, Scotty, is that it was staged, and this is the problem that Democrats make: is they assume black people, all black people, are Democrats, and we know that that's just not true. I, I want to segue into something re- re- really quick, Scotty, and you have been uh, a champion when it comes to issues of mass surveillance. Uh, we were earlier we were talking about the release of Kwame Kilpatrick, and we were talking about you know, you know mass surveillance on black males. I mean, what's your thoughts? You know, right now we've got five G towers that are literally all over the country. Uh, and, and Brussels actually just made history because Brussels is one of the first global nations that said we don't want it here because of the health concerns. I mean, is this – and this is a political issue. Is this something the, – the, some on the left have said, well, you know, it's, 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 it's limiting the digital divide, and it's going to provide all this technology and access. Others have said there are major health issues around it, and some have said that it's, a, it's the beginning – of the beginning of the end of mass surveillance of certain individuals in these United States. I mean, your thoughts on this? Should 5G, should we fear 5G technology or should we embrace it? You know, I, and I certainly don't think our politicians should be encouraging it, and they are. They're thinking, oh, this is the next big thing. we got to, like, you know, make the, open, open the doors wide to promote this new technology, and it's a bad idea. For one thing, um, yeah, and you're, the application of that type of um, that frequency to mass surveillance has been is has been and is being used in China which has a social credit system where based upon your behavior um, they actually have something similar to a credit score which is based upon your behavior in like I could say your private life except there is no such thing under these circumstances and, um, and, and that that's one hazard and another hazard um, though is the health concerns, and I have I know a number of people. In fact, one person I know is a outspoken um, person named John Cater. He actually um, was seeking nomination for governor back um, a couple of years ago. But he um, he's been one of the people I know leading the charge to um, to stop this 5G stuff because apparently there are a lot of um, health risks to um, health that it may increase cancer risk. Um, there has been that that frequency may affect neurological processes because you've got electromagnetic activity in the brain that may be just more susceptible to some frequencies than others. And probably one of the more blatant, just annoying aspects of 5G is apparently the towers need to be exceptionally close together. And by putting them, and I don't, I'm not quite sure why, but it has something to do with the penetrating ability of shorter wavelengths. Does it make it mm-hmm. um, through obstacles as well as longer mm-hmm. ones? I think that's probably part of it. And um, that they, so you'd end up having to build more towers in more places in our communities, and that's like more of an interruption um, where people may have to give up their property using something like eminent domain or something to make more room for more of these towers that there's really no demand for except by you know, members kind of the establishment. But the average but, 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 but hold, hold on, hold on. But Scotty, but, Scotty, but, but, Scotty, I thought the whole point of 5G technology was to make sure that we ended the digital divide in America. You know, you do it that people can – right now, it, it, there may be a lot of reasons people aren't on the Internet, but it isn't because the frequency 
of your network isn't 5G. It might be because you don't own a computer or you don't have a smartphone or you can't pay for a good data plan and that kind of thing. But but whether or not there's a 5G network has nothing to do with um, whether or not we have a digital divide. In some cases, it's a matter of people not being comfortable with using that technology or not wanting to learn about it. And some people are just kind of stuck in their ways. They like have doing things a certain way and don't feel that they should be required to have to do something otherwise. Let let me ask you this, because I've heard your work and I've read your work. I mean, when you talk about mass, uh, excuse me, when you talk about uh, mass surveillance, uh, because some have said that 5G is the beginning of this mass surveillance uh, on the American people, the end of privacy rights as we know it. I mean, how does that affect specifically African-American voters when they're already targeted with the limited technology that we have now? Yeah, and that's one thing. Apparently, the um, ability of that technology to distinguish um, between individual African-Americans is much worse than its ability to distinguish between members of other groups. And that is um, what has led to um, our friend um, Mr. Burton calling it um, techno-racism, Commissioner Burton, um, because, I mean, it's technology that, at least the way it's applied right now, is racist and that it does not rec- rec- recognize, sorry, does not accurately recognize African Americans as well as other groups. And, um, you know, there's a concern then that already misidentification, which has been, um, a, a tragic problem in the past where people and you get falsely imprisoned and all kinds of things simply being misidentified because some people aren't able to distinguish between African Americans um, and witnesses and specifically so they give you know confused testimony and now we got technology that can give you know confused testimony also and also fail to accurately distinguish between different individuals so that is a legitimate concern it's one of the many problems that come up um, with mass surveillance. I mean, the other problems that come up, and actually on my end, I'm more worried about it being accurate than than about it being inaccurate because my feeling is that, well, let's say we fix all those problems. Well, I don't want something that's, you know, keeping track of my every move. I simply don't want that. That isn't the kind of country I want to live in. I want to live in a free country where I have personal choices, and part of having a personal choice is also having privacy. Um, and that is taking away a lot of privacy. That e- even if you're in a public space, to in some extent there is an expectation of privacy because when you move from one place to another, from one group of people to another group of people, you don't expect there to be one common database that can keep track of your movement from one place to the next. Um, so I think there is an issue on a violating reasonable expectation of privacy on that scale. Let me ask you this, because I have been very critical. And what's ironic, Scotty, and anybody on 313-778-7600, this is Straight Talk. We're talking to Scotty Bowman. Uh, We're talking about – we're talking with Scotty Bowman. We're talking about 5G technology and mass surveillance. Uh, uh, Can can technology, can 5G be trusted? Uh, I want to get back to you. I mean, you know, I I don't often agree with Representative Rashida Tlaib. A matter of fact, I probably don't agree with her 99%. But I did agree when she talked about the dangers of mass surveillance when it came to some of the, the blue light technology that uh, certain police departments use. I mean, your thoughts on this, Scotty? I mean, I mean, is this stuff safe? I mean, I mean, are the is the does the data actually match the crime? Well, it might and it might not. And by the way, one thing interesting, I don't know, if it, um, Mr. Ben Bolio, I don't think Brian took up about this, but some of the the groups that meet up that I've um, met up with where there's a lot of people feeling strongly about 5G. Uh, I've seen him at those meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I it, the problem is it doesn't really um, – the, the people are being surveilled whether or not they're committing a crime. And I mean, that's part of the thing is when there is a reasonable cause, a probable cause, to investigate somebody – it is customary for them to, to then lose some privacy in the course of the investigation to see if there's more evidence that this person's committing a crime. Um, with this technology, none of that um, you know, um, institutional boundary is 
present to prevent that kind of abuse. Now, there are people saying, well, we're going to keep it, you know, we're going to keep all this stuff secure in a secure place, and we're not going to look at it without problem cause. But it's all there. And, of course, this is also the same problem we have with the NSA's database that Edward Snowden noted people who weren't supposed to be looking were looking at what other people were doing. Um, so I, I, I think the safest way to avoid abuse of the surveillance state is to not have a surveillance state, to not have um, the, the government deploying systems to do mass surveillance on people. I don't think that should happen. I don't think they should be requiring telecommunication companies to save more data than that company would want to do on its own for surveillance purposes either. And that's another thing that um, apparently gets written into these laws. I want to want to sit you with one more one more thing. Want to want to touch on one more topic, Scott. I mean, right now, I mean, and I, you know, libertarians, I, and in many cases, are on point when it comes to the economy. Uh, last week, it was reported that now there's a second $2 trillion stimulus payment being paid out. Uh, some on the left want it, some on the right don't. Uh, and there are over 100,000 small businesses that are collapsing and over 36 million Americans who are literally either out of work or prepared to be out of work. Uh, are we moving in the right direction with another stimulus check, or is that bad for America? Well, it's bad for America, but it's sort of a situation that they set up to be they set it up to be necessary. Let me phrase it that way. Because what happened is we have a manufactured depression. It isn't hit yet, but it, it, well, already we got some of the indicators. Low unemployment. We have forced unemployment at a very high level. Um, we and I think the other moves being made, we had price control. So guess what? It was shocking. There was empty shelves in stores. There were shortages. We people had trouble finding toilet paper, and then, then probably it's going to be meat next. Um, there's all these things happening that one associates with depression. So so far, there's been a good Band-Aid on it, and it's only been for a few months, and so they throw money at us. Well, that isn't helping either in the long run. In the short run, I mean, my thought is, okay, the government's been stealing, you know, um, thousands and thousands of dollars from me every year, so I have no problem getting getting some of it back, though it's, it's peanuts. So they send me a $1,200 check, and they want me to pay them another $4,000 or whatever above what they were taking on my paycheck already. So, you know, it's like I'd rather they simply didn't take money from me rather than throwing peanuts back. But what happens now is to do that, to throw all, all these peanuts at everybody, they, they're, they're creating a tremendous debt. That is um, ultimately got to be paid somehow. And if nobody pays it, it's defaulted, well, it's monetized, and we all pay in depreciation of the currency. So somehow, you know, the chickens will come back to roost, and I don't think people are going to like what they what they see when it finally happens. Um, so they've created a situation where they have to help out necessarily because they've made people less able to help themselves, because they've crippled the economy so that the marketplace can't, you know, generate more solutions to solve more problems. They've taken a top-down approach, and this actually uh, is mainly at the state level um, with governors like um, our queen. And I, I say queen, the reason I say that is because a governor does not have the kind of power she's exercising. She's exercising fiat powers. Um, so, so, oh, hold on, hold on, Scotty. So, I mean, but here's, here's the issue that I have. I mean, we're talking about billions of, of the Amer trillions of the American people's money being spent uh, in the name of you know this stimulus and and, and this, this 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 disaster uh, called coronavirus, COVID nineteen, whatever you want to call it. But my issue is, when does it stop, Scotty? I mean, when do the payments stop? Well, I think they're probably going to stop <laughs> right when um, the the economic damage just becomes too much to bear. But I don't know when it's going to hit that. I'm actually surprised how resilient our economy has been to a ridiculous amount of bad practices by the politicians. Um, I mean, the point is they, they've created a desperate situation where people need help from somewhere. So, but, it, but again, it's not like people should not view the government as a savior because they send them a check or because they're giving, um, giving them tests without asking them to pay or anything like that because 
the problem was created by government intervention, and the government has already taken way more money from us than they're throwing back at us. But guess what? That doesn't mean that that money is just sitting there waiting to be given back to us either. It actually um, has been we, – our government has borrowed so much money that what you're paying in in taxes is mostly paying interest on a debt. All right. Hold, 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 hold on, Scott. Hold on, Scott. We've got to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're on with Scotty Bubba. We're talking about your money. The government wants to give you back your $2 trillion stimulus, $1,200 check. But guess what, folks? You already paid for it because it's your money. We'll talk about it when we come back on Street Talk. Are you getting the most out of your Medicare plan? Are you sure? Many people with Medicare are eligible for plans that include extra benefits in addition to those found in original Medicare. Benefits like dental, vision, and prescription drug coverage. Call now to see if you're eligible to enroll. The consultation is free with no obligation to enroll. In addition to hospital and medical coverage, at no extra cost, you could also get coverage for prescription drugs, dental, hearing, vision, and more. In many areas, plans with benefits are available with $0 copays for many services, $0 monthly premiums, or $0 deductibles. That's hospital, medical, prescription drug, dental coverage, and more included in one plan with premiums that may be as low as $0 a month. Call now to see if you're eligible to enroll. The consultation is free and there's no obligation to enroll. Call 1-800-571-8580. That's 1-800-571-8580. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis, and this is Atomic Beam USA. Another bright idea from Bulbhead, the ultra-bright, tough-grade flashlight that features tactical technology used by U.S. Special Forces. This flashlight has a feeble 125 lux output. The Atomic Beam USA has up to 5,000 lux. That's 40 times more. We're going to drop it hundreds of feet from this helicopter. It hits the tarmac, and it's still working. That's what I call a tough flashlight. Heavy downpours, mud puddles, even extreme temperatures are no match. You could spend over $100, or the Atomic Beam USA can be yours for just $19.99 with free lifetime guarantee. Order now, you can double it and get a second Atomic Beam USA. Just pay a separate fee, and we'll even ship them to you for free. Atomic Beam USA is just $19.99. Order now. Call 1-800-638-2619 to get your Atomic Beam USA. Call now or go to AtomicBeam.com. So call 1-800-638-2619. Deluxe version available. Order now. They'll challenge your authority. They'll try to break your will. They'll push you to the edge of your sanity. Because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory, not theirs. Defend it. Who makes the payments? Who cleans it? Who drives it? You do. That's who. And in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kids buckle up. We're here with uh, we're still talking to Scotty Bowman. Scotty, before we before you go, uh, I just want to ask you. I mean, right now, you know, federal government is Democrats are proposing that uh, there should be a program in the federal government that hires them those people who have been affected by the unemployment benefits. I mean, you know, when I hear that, Scotty, I automatically think of the government getting too big and growing. I mean, what's your thoughts on this? Is this the right thing to do for those unemployed Americans, or is it the beginning of a bigger government than we've ever seen before? It's probably the beginning of a bigger government than we've ever seen before, which is already what I've been seeing in just the past few months. I mean, our, not much of this year went by before we saw, um, I mean, pretty much a level of totalitarianism that exceeds what would be common daily life prior to this epidemic, even in like Red China or the USSR back in the day. I mean, the, that, the notion 
that, you know, that people can't even peaceably assemble, are told they can't travel, are fined a thousand dollars just for, you know, hanging out at somebody's house or having a party. Um, that that already is a level of tyranny I have yet see. I mean, it's the worst really invasion on civil liberties since um, the Civil War. The um, and so we have you know that level of um, authoritarianism, and then of course the government of the economic aspect comes in as kind of you know a riding on the horseback of that. That we have um, all these programs now to rescue people from the deleterious effects of the policies of the government instituted, which effectively, you know, put a whole bunch of businesses just on, you just said simply you can't do business. I mean, there's various things that could cause someone to go out of business, but I think what could be more direct than simply saying you can't sell things, you can't provide services, or cause unemployment as in you can't go to work. Um, so, yeah, they're, then they're turning around and saying, oh, we're going to help you. We're going to give you jobs. So they take away jobs, and now they're giving jobs. So, yeah, it, it's definitely a shift toward greater government control. I can see a lot of people as, um, you know, libertarians, for instance, who I'm, I'm involved with, well, if they're talking about, you know, supporting less government, and people are like, oh, but we need socialism. See, socialism saved us. Socialism gave us jobs. Socialism is getting that deposit in my bank account. You know, socialism is keeping people from doing dangerous things. Well, no. What, they're, what they've done is created a need, and now they have presented a solution to that need. And, um, and so we have this new synthesis where they're trying to bring about this mindset that, oh, okay, so it really, it, we really do need bigger government. You know, Scott, you, you know, Scott before you go, this reminds me of Orson Welles' 1984 of something called the problem reaction solution theory. And folks, if you're listening, this is straight talk, but we're talking straight to you. It's I create the problem, you react, and I offer the solution. But here's the catch, folks. The issue is I didn't tell you I was the one that created the problem. Might go over your head, but it's a little too deep for tonight. Scotty, we'll, we'll, I'll definitely bring you back on the show. You're a great American, and we'll have you back on. Where can we find you out there? Oh, well, I'm, I'm easy to find. If you go to, you know, you just put Scotty Bowman without the W. I do not have a W in my last name, B-O-M-A-N. You search that, you'll find all kinds of stuff about me out there. Um, I've got contact forms. And, you, know, you could go to actually bowmanfordetroit.org for one of my most recent projects in the, in the city of Detroit that I'm on. Um, but I'm, I'm always available somewhere. I'm actually very accessible. All right, all right. Scotty, we'll have you back on soon, my friend. All right, take care. Uh, all right, all right. Joining us all the way from the Big Apple, New York City, we've got the executive director of Sensibility, uh, Roy Paul. Uh, he's a political strategist and the new executive director of a finance group that teaches young people about finances. But it sounds like we need to teach those folks in Washington how to use and spend their money. Roy, welcome to Street Talk. Thank you. Good to be with you. So, Roy, let me ask you this. I mean, when you hear, and I just talked to my colleague earlier, when you hear 36 million people out of work, uh, 100,000 jobs that are getting ready to fold, and the fact of $3 trillion of the American people's money slowly coming back to them, what does that mean to you? Does that scare somebody like you who teach people about how to spend their money? Uh, scares the heck out of me because the number of Americans that are out of work reported by the government, it's usually a lot less than the actual number of people who are unemployed. And we knew that before this pandemic hit, that there were millions of Americans who operated every day, every year with no budget at all. Half of the country don't have a budget. Uh, and so that's before the pandemic hit. So these are people, when you think of these unemployment numbers, you have to factor in that there's a vast majority of them who literally have no money. They have no savings. They didn't have a budget before this pandemic happened. Uh, and so when you talk about the struggle, it really is real. These are people who are at the food pantry lines. They're struggling to pay the rent for their, their families. Uh, so these really are the heart of it. The people who have money, the people who had a safety net, 
they're not struggling. They may be on an unemployment because they lost their jobs, but they can still pay their rent. They can still put food in their mouth. But when you count the millions of people who don't have any money for food and for home, that scares the heck out of me. I'm going to play a clip from you. You played it three times already, but you know what, folks? I'm going to play it four times because I want you to hear what your Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, thinks about you. Roll them. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause it's I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. They don't have all right, let's stop. Let's stop right there. I, 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 mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, first of all, Roy, you and I have actually done uh, The Breakfast Club in the past. And so it, it's interesting that Charlemagne the God, who I normally agree with, didn't scold Joe Biden for saying this. He gave him a free pass. I mean, what does this mean? I mean, these are the people that when you talk about not being prepared, unfortunately, it's not just white folks, it's black folks too, that are going to be struggling in this new normal. Well, I don't think anybody listening to that interview really believes that Joe Biden is a racist, okay? Now, you can say that it was an article, he used the wrong word, he was off the cuff, whatever you want to say. But no one really thinks that he's a racist because he said if you're struggling between me and Donald Trump, you're not black. What I think is happening in this country is that we really have become too politically correct. I don't want to sound like Donald Trump. But we are nitpicking on every single comment that someone makes. You say, ah, gotcha, ah, gotcha. That's a sound clip right there. But no one really believes he's a racist. Let me, let me ask you this, Roy. I mean, I mean, Simone Sanders, I, I, I believe, is Joe Biden's point person for African Americans. Uh, this is the third or second uh, mistake, screw up, that the vice president has made. I mean, should she be fired? For simply not, I mean, I mean, this I hope ran through her office before he did this interview. I mean, she you know, of course she shouldn't be. Of course she shouldn't be fired. That's how it was. Look, when you are employed by a position, he's the, the candidate. Your job, if it is her job, to write his speeches, to give him talking points, tell him what the facts are on an issue. It's not her job to be on standby in the event he makes an off-the-cuff remark that wasn't prepared beforehand. So I mean, Roy, 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 hold, 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 hold on, hold on, Roy. Hold, hold on, Roy. Hold on, Roy. I've got to push back because you know and I know that if a Republican even uttered these words, they'd be called their, – their resignation would be on the table. Well, the difference is if a Republican said it, they would have probably had the intent of being racist. When Joe Biden said it, his intent was not to be racist because of the history. Joe Biden as a Democrat's history is not the same as a Republican, whoever that may be. Put Donald Trump in that position. He has an intent of being racist. He has said racist things in the past. If Donald Trump said it, we would assume that he had racist intent. But Joe Biden does not have racist intent because of his background. Simone Sanders should not be held accountable for an off-the-cuff remark that the principal made. That's ridiculous. You know. But, but, but wait a minute. But, I mean, wait a minute, Roy. i got to push back again because wasn't the 94 crime bill a racist bill against black men in America? I mean, wasn't the rebuke? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's fair to characterize it as a racist bill. I do think it's fair to say that the result of the – enactment of the bill disproportionately affected black and brown people. I think that's fair, and that's something that Joe Biden has said, but it wasn't his intent when he supported the bill. Neither was it the intent of the Clintons when they supported the bill. So you have to look at the intent. It's like stop and frisk. No one says, I want to go out there and have black and brown people for it, you know, disrespected by the police. But the process is that sometimes the result of a policy leads in a different way that you didn't really uh, envision in the first place. And I think that's what you have here. So to say that because of the crime bill, this kind that means he's racist, I think is a false equivalency. Now, let me ask you this, Roy. I mean, you do a lot of work in the community on Wall Street around uh, uh, getting people financial literacy and making them sound about what's going on. Who's the, who's the biggest population at risk? when it comes to COVID-19 and the finances right now? Well, it, it, it is young people because young people are 
it's, you know, depending on where you are, if you're graduating from college, then you're going to be hit because this will delay your ability to get a job. Think about the job market. A lot of people don't talk about this. The people who are unemployed, half of them won't get their jobs back. And when they do go back to look for work, there's going to be a massive amount of people looking for work. Can you imagine being a recent college graduate trying to find a job after COVID-19? It would be impossible for you to get a job unless you have connections and resources. So I'm really scared for the young people who are coming out trying to get an internship or a you know, first job. It's going to be impossible for them. Older people have had time to gather their resources. If you're retired, then you probably have a pension or Social Security. Those in the middle have a safety net. But it's the young people who are entering this market now that really have no safety net. They're trying to find a job. And if you're in a hot pocket area in New York City, they're talking about it reopening sometime after the summer, right? So there are parts of the country that are starting to get opened up now. But for the hot hit areas that won't open up past the summer and beyond where there is no date for opening up right now, I, I don't know how you do it. Let me so let me read something out of New York. Right? And you and I have talked about uh, you know, vice presidential candidates. You talked about Kamala Harris. Just recently recently she came out and she rebuked this uh, the president for using the term calling coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, the Chinese virus. Uh, I, I mean, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, the bottom line is, Roy, I mean, the virus came out of Wuhan, China. I mean, thus, it's a Chinese virus. I, and that's not a knock, but let me ask you this. I mean, I mean, is she right to say that is the president using racial terms uh, when it comes to this virus, or is the president calling calling it what it is. It's a virus that came out of China. Your thoughts on that? So I think that it goes back to the intent. Look, the, the CDC and other health organizations labeled this COVID-19 for a reason, because they did not want it to disproportionately affect people from China or Asian Americans who are being targeted by people who say, you're the reason for this virus, they're Asian American, go back home, or whatever. So I think that if the president's intent was to shed light on where it comes from, he can say that by saying COVID-19 came from China. He can say that, and everyone would agree with him because that's a fact. But when you say it's the Chinese virus, he's specifically saying that because he wants people to equate the virus with Chinese Americans or China. It's the same thing. And that's where the intent leads me to believe that he does not want people to hold fast to the truth that this did come from China. No one's disputing that it came from China. But when he wants to deflect attention from the administration's response to COVID-19 and say, well, the Chinese are to blame, the Chinese are to blame, he can't get that out of his vocabulary. The Chinese are to blame. We could have stopped it in China, he keeps saying. We could have stopped. So, so that so is we're, irrelevant. So we're, can't, so we're no limited, blaming oh, oh, oh. Trump for the virus, but we are blaming his response to it. So, Roy, let me ask you this. Who is the, is the Chinese government to blame for the rise of this viral disease that has literally attacked the entire globe. It came out of Wuhan. I mean, is the and Chinese that's, government... And that's not in dispute. Life? That's not in dispute. But what's in dispute is him laying the leg of the Chinese virus. Why didn't the WHO, the CDC, why aren't they calling it the Chinese virus? Do you know why? Why? Do you know why? They're, they're not calling it that because they have noted that it labels something based on an ethnicity, China, Chinese, that's an ethnicity, that it will disproportionately affect people who will be harassed by it being labeled the Chinese virus. That's why they don't use that term. It has never been designated as the correct term for describing this virus. It is COVID-19. And that's what the president should refer it as, and he knows that, but he purposefully is diverting attention for people to say it's the Chinese virus that comes from China because she's trying to distract from people and say, you know, we don't like what's going on. We're so blaming it on Chinese Americans. It's COVID-19, and he can get around it by continuing to say COVID-19 started in China. No one disputes that. It originated in Wuhan. No one disputes that, but it's not called the Chinese virus. Let me ask you this. I mean, in, in Huffington Post recently, uh, there was a article written that said that now New York City, as well as Detroit and other cities, will start to accept uh, flights in and out of China. I mean, your thoughts on this, is that making Americans safer or, or less safe? 
Well, I, I don't think anyone should be allowing people in from China right now, to be honest with you. And I'm not saying that because I'm a racist. I'm saying that because I think that because the virus did originate in China, I mean, there's no one who disputes that. All of the health experts agree that it came from China. We have to make sure that if we import people from that area, that it's clear. Right? We have to make sure but that wait, it's but, safe. Oh, 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 but, 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 but Roy, but Roy you're, now you're admitting that it's the Chinese virus. If you're saying no, no, that you I'm don't want to be around it, Chinese no, folks, no, no, it's no, a Chinese virus. No, 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 no. I'm admitting that it came from China. I'm, I've never disputed that it came from China. Everything I've read, everything suggests that it came from China. What I'm disputing is labeling it the Chinese virus, and I do think that before we start importing people from China, especially from Wuhan, we should make sure that the virus has been eradicated. They've done that in other places, New Zealand. They've eradicated the virus. So when we start seeing the dip in the number of people affected and death, then I think we should revisit it. But right now it's too hot. Right now we shouldn't be allowing people in. Not because I'm a racist and I don't like Chinese people, but because I think that it's important that we make sure that we eradicate the virus from coming into the United States. So let me ask you this. I mean, I mean, right now, you know, we talked about Kamala Harris and, and her, uh, 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 you know, rebuking the president for his comments. I mean, I mean, do you think that she is at the top of the ticket for becoming Joe Biden's running mate, or who would you say is at the bottom and who is at the top of, of that list at this point? Well, I think whoever he picks needs to be someone from a swing state. Don't know who he's going to pick. I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't know any of them. But I think that it should be someone from a state that we desperately need to win. Uh, he's already committed himself to a woman, and you know, that's his prerogative. Uh, but whoever it is, uh, black, white, you name it, should come from a swing state, in my opinion. Let me ask you this. Do you think that it was wise for the vice president to immediately say that he would com- he would focus on picking a woman as opposed to Bernie Sanders, who said he would focus on picking and selecting the best candidate? Yeah, that wouldn't have been my decision. I would not have done it. Um, not that I would not have eventually picked a woman, but I think that in politics, the decision that you make in January, for example, is different from what you would make in March, April, or May. Right? The tide shifts. Sometimes you look at five candidates, and then something happens. You put them in vetting. You find out someone has an extramarital affair. You find out that someone is X, Y, or Z. They don't pull well with the electorate. So I would not have pigeonholed myself into a specific box. But I would have said, look, it's an open field. Everyone apply. But I think, look, he was in a primary that was pretty brutal already. He was trying to win. He was suffocating. And he needed a lifeline. If it wasn't for South Carolina, he wouldn't have had that. So he felt like he owed people. He felt like he needed to do something to distinguish himself. And he did it to himself. Uh, now, will it work? I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on who he picks. If he picks someone that's not from a swing state, but it's actually going to hurt him in a swing state, well, some of the candidates are liberal. And you put them in Minnesota, you put them in Michigan or Wisconsin, and I think people are going to turn on that. We've seen that. The Republican Party isn't dead by any stretch. They are these elections that are happening, uh, California 25, the one in Wisconsin, and Republicans are voting for Republicans, right? So we have to understand that the turnout has been high for Republicans in a district, in districts and in a year where you would say, hey, you know, maybe Republicans don't like the president. But his approval numbers are high. Uh, Republicans are voting, and I think we should pick someone who appeals to the middle of the road trying to pick someone who is so far to the left who turns a middle of America off, I don't think it's the best way to go. All right. 313-778-7600. This is Straight Talk. We're talking to Roy Paul. Uh, he's the executive director of Sensibility in the Big Apple, New York City. Roy, stay safe out there. Roy, oh, l- l- let me ask you this. Really, before you go, uh, we've got a little bit of time left. What is the impact that COVID-19 is going to have on the economy and even the local economy. I mean, this is what you do. I mean, I mean, I mean, should Americans, you know, is it over or should Americans be scared if another wave comes? What's the impact? Well, I think we should be. I think we should be scared if another wave comes. But I think the biggest thing that this pandemic has shown us is how vulnerable the economy is. Right? It only takes one pandemic to wipe a whole bunch of people out. Uh, and I think that's a warning sign, not just to school districts and universities who have literally been, I think, ripping students off, if you want to know the truth. Students have not been learning the fundamentals uh, of personal finance and the things that actually they need to survive. 
colleges have really been ripping students off when it comes to the high price of tuition. And even in the midst of this pandemic, where they have told students, don't come to campus, they want to charge full tuition. Right? So they have, it shouldn't really be illegal. And I hope a lot of students file, you know, action lawsuits and, and, and get, you know, hit back at this because they're really being screwed in the wallet. Uh, and I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. Um, and jobs, quite frankly, haven't been paying enough money for people to do the work that they're hiring them to do. You know, you get a job and you, you know, if you're not making minimum wage, you're making just enough so that you can pay your rent at a place like New York City and have no safety net whatsoever. That has got to stop. And I don't know what the legislators across the country are doing. Some of them are Democratic. In New York, we have a Democratic legislature. And if you ask me, they have not done enough to put enough safeguards in place with the minimum wage and other things to give people a safety net in this country. And I think it's wrong, and it should stop, and the people should be voted against it. Roy, last before you go, why is financial literacy uh, not a policy issue? I mean, I mean, Donald Trump should be talking about this. Joe Biden should be talking about this. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, we're a nation built on debt. Uh, is this something that uh, you see is going to change? Is, the, is COVID going to increase the narrative around uh, making sure people know how to use their money? Yeah. So the pandemic is really akin to a revolution. It's going to have to. People are going to have to start talking about it because there are going to be situations that people are in that but for their being able to have enough money and to budget wisely, they're not going to be able to make it through. In New York City, I'm surrounded by people who can't pay their rent. And what people aren't talking about is the fact that after all of these forbearances are going on, you know, they prevented people from getting evicted in New York. But what they don't tell you, we don't have to pay that much back. You know, after this pandemic is over, you're going to get a great period of however long. The courts are going to open up. Landlords are going to start evicting tenants who can't pay their rent. So if you don't have money, if you're not saving, if you're not budgeting, you really are not going to be able to work. The only lifeline you have is a payment plan because you're not going to be able to pay back $10,000 plus dollars when you have no money. You're going to have to go to your landlord and say, look, I'm going to have to pay you back X amount of dollars every month over time so that I can pay you back. And you need a budget. You need a plan. And people are going to get wise to the fact that if you don't teach people how to open up a calculator, I don't care if you don't do arithmetic by hand, but open up a calculator, add some chat, and start clicking those buttons, you're not going to be able to make it. All right. That is Roy Paul, Executive Director of Sensibility in the Big Apple, New York City. Roy, we got to bring you back on. You're a great American. Where can we find you? Um, well, I try not to be found, to be honest with you. I try to stay off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want to find me, you can go on social media, Google me, and uh, to the Internet, you'll find me very easily. All right, all right. Roy, we'll have you back on too, my friend. Stay safe out there in, in New York City. Adios. All right, all right. All right, so before we go, I mean, I just want to just have a conversation with folks out there who are listening, whether you're in, you know, Detroit to Houston or, or, or New York to, to L.A., we're talking about the fact that, folks, we've got a tale of two issues. We've got one guy that people can't stand, but the reality is, before COVID, the economy was much better. Matter of fact, much better than we've seen in probably 20 years. We've got prison and reform that is literally allowing and setting people free. We've got an economy that is there tight. We've got uh, America is much safer now than it has been before because we're taking the fight to the enemy. And then we've got another guy who simply believes that if you ain't voting Democrat, you ain't black. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. And I'm not telling you to take sides. I'm telling you the fact that we've got a problem in this country. The problem is we've got an establishment, not going to get into partisanship, but we've got a certain element in the left that believes that black people – are owned by the DNC. I mean, you heard it. The leader, the second most powerful person in the United States said that if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. This is a much deeper route. You know, one of my callers talked about the fact that they said that, you know, would this, would Joe Biden have said this in another setting? Probably not. You know why? Because there's an expectation. People, I think that that expectation has changed, where now we live in America where now privacy is no longer. We have a situation now where uh, when people talk about privacy rights and they talk about public safety, people will literally give up their safety 
just to be or think that they are actually safe when in term government is growing. And the reality is government is not growing for you. They're growing to control you. That's what we're dealing with, folks. We're going to continue on this topic in the next couple of weeks. But as I say to you, stay strong and stay blessed out there. And stay tuned because this is Straight Talk where we have facts, not fiction. We're going to tune out. And until next time, keep it sexy and keep it going. And we're going to have, we got a great show actually next week. We're going to get into the issue going back into Joe Biden. Uh, What is he going to say next? We don't know. But stay tuned. We'll come back. And like I said, next Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the People's Champ. I'm here, Brandon Bryson. We'll come back next time on Straight Talk. Good night.